Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax. Although today, uh, we're not actually going to be talking about the Siege itself. Or rather, it is finally time to answer a question I have seen many of you ask yourselves in the comment sections. Why, if the defenders are merely misled loyalists, why do we see so much in the way of chaos iconography? And if they truly are chaos worshippers, why do we also see imperial icons like the Aquila adorning some of their bunkers? To answer that question, we need to roll the clock back a bit, to a point just after Cardinal Zaphon had been appointed to his new position, and he decided to set out on a pilgrimage to tour the worlds and the masses he must now guide. And with him he brought a humble entourage by Ecclesiarchy standards, of some 1,000 souls, and counted amongst them was a young deacon by the name Othma Moon, and he had been playing for the wrong team for quite some time already, although I hasten to point out we do not know exactly to what degree the good deacon had been switching sides. All we do know is that he had been reading some rather provocative literature, and had come to the conclusion that the Imperium was unsalvageable. It was corrupt virtually to its very core, and the only way to fix it was to burn the whole rotten structure to the ground and begin anew with a fresh, enlightened perspective. But of course, the Good Deacon had nowhere even remotely close to the amount of power such an undertaking would require. His new master, however, well, at the very least, it would be a start. However, Mamoon was very much so aware that his opinions would be considered uh, dangerous, at absolute best, and outright heretical at worst. And the Imperium does not tolerate either. Mamoon would have to step very very lightly around the Cardinal, and so he made sure that he never outright suggested anything, he merely pointed things out, wondered aloud, or searched for the truth, the correct version of the truth at least, whenever he was around the Cardinal, in an attempt to ingratiate himself, and one of the first thing he noticed was that the Cardinal, a rather sheltered person who had spent practically the entirety of his life on the Cardinal world, being raised, pampered, and groomed by the old Cardinal, he was extraordinarily disturbed when he saw the often wretched conditions under which his flock lived. And what disturbed him even more was how swiftly they could be roused to anger and outright violence even over what appeared to be fairly petty things. There was, for example, a minor incident where a handful of faithful were trampled to death under the weight of their brethren, as they rushed forward to try and get a glimpse of the Cardinal. This event disturbed Zaphon greatly, and Mamoon, understanding that this was the way in to the Cardinal's inner circle, and eventually his mind, set about finding ways to not only exploit, but to recreate such happenstances. Essentially, whenever and wherever the Cardinal stopped to make a speech, problems would almost inevitably occur. The man drew incredibly sized crowds, cause, well, again, I need to point out just how big of a deal this actually is. A Cardinal, an Imperial Cardinal visiting just a random world is something akin to the Pope visiting a small Catholic village. There's uh, not going to be a whole lot of people in said village that aren't going to be showing up to shake his hand, metaphorically speaking in the case of Cardinal Zaphon, considering there were hundreds of thousands if not millions of people that were showing up. And controlling those kinds of numbers is very, very difficult. Controlling them when they've got a pinch of religious fever and an influence perhaps by a certain deacon, things get a hell of a lot more complicated very, very quickly. Another, far more unfortunate incident soon occurred, when a group of faithful having spotted a 
vulnerability, shall we say, in the security cordon surged forward to try and get a bit of a closer, more upfront and personal look at their idol, the Cardinal. And Zaphon's faithful bodyguards of Adepta Sororita's Battle Sisters found it necessary to turn their weapons onto the crowd. Fully automatic grenade launchers at point blank range into a throng of people. It quickly became a uh, rather messy scene, as I'm sure you can imagine. And this one in particular affected the young cardinal. Young being a rather relative term here, as I'm sure you understand. Not only because it was probably the most gory and horrible thing he'd ever seen, but also in large part due to Deacon Mamoon's prodding. Oh, good Cardinal, how could this ever have happened? The very adept of Sororitas, the brides of the Emperor himself, the purest, most uncorruptible members of our entire wide Imperium, firing upon the faithful just because their zeal momentarily overcame them. Surely you, Cardinal, as well understand that there is no way they would ever have caused you any harm. They were loyal followers of you. They idolized you, and yet... Such a tragic end. Whatever will I say to their families? What answer will I give them? How could I possibly ever explain such a tragedy? There simply are no words to explain it, no reason to be found unless uh, I hesitate to even utter the words, good Cardinal, but the Adepta Sororitas are, of course, warriors at heart, and I am sure such menial tasks as mere security detail is chafing at their warrior spirit. Perhaps it might be better if we were to find them more honourable duties and, and keep them somewhat separated from the faithful masses, both for the protection of their own immortal souls and our faithful masses. Of course, this is just an example, but I'm sure you get the uh, general idea, and it didn't take many more incidents like this. I'm not saying that Mamoon engineered any of it, of course, but they did start happening with frightening irregularity. And just as abruptly, they also ceased to happen once Mamoon was put in charge of security. Hmm. Damn hard-working young Deacon, that Mamoon fella. Good guy, good guy, and so talented as well. What an organizer. But... Of course, even such a talented individual as Deacon Mamoon couldn't prevent any and all problems. Suddenly, the number of conspiracies against the Cardinals skyrocketed. Attempts at sabotage, assassination, thieving, betrayal, all kinds of horrible nonsense. And Deacon Mamoon, of course, uncovered all of it and brought it to the Cardinal, one by one with ever-increasing numbers and frequency, at which point once again he wondered, oh, good gracious Cardinal, how can this be? How can there be so many traitors amongst our midst? If only there was something we could do. If we could limit information somehow, if we could bring those we trust close and keep them close, where we could ensure that they were worthy of our continued trust. If only there was some form of inner circle, perhaps. If only. If only. <laughs> and of course, soon thereafter, Deacon Mamoon was put in charge of vetting people for just such an organization. A de facto echo chamber for the Cardinal to sit inside of Surrounded by Mamoon and his closest ideological pals. And just like any form of pressure in a closed compartment, when radical ideas are bandied around for long enough, they tend to grow more and more and more radical. Until soon, the Cardinal thought that 
Deacon Mamoon's ideas were his very own ideas, and he supported them 100%. It was indeed necessary to cleanse the rotten Imperium with a holy crusade, to sweep away the sin that had so deeply stained the Imperium of Man, and who better to lead such a venture than a bona fide cardinal? But of course, arriving at the conclusion that the whole rotten structure had to go was one thing. Actually lighting the fire was another thing entirely. With his current power and influence, the Cardinal could at most create a mild and exceedingly temporary inconvenience for local sector command. Far from burning down the Imperium, he would go into history as little more than a footnote of some backwater planetary system. He would have to prepare, and the ideal position to do this in was, as mentioned in the first video, the Plant of Vrax. It would present the Cardinal with a wonderful jumping off point for his eventual Holy Crusade. Being able, as Vrax was, to supply considerable quantities of weapons, vehicles, and general supplies to the Cardinal's faithful hordes. However, what neither the Cardinal nor the Good Deacon had realized was that Mamoon wasn't talking entirely out of his ass when he mentioned that the Inquisition might be getting somewhat interested in the Cardinal's affairs. It turned out that the Inquisition had been keeping a close eye on the Cardinal ever since he left the Cardinal Worlds. As mentioned in the first video, the Inquisition always gets a little bit nervous when a Cardinal leaves his gilded cage. Especially when he seems to be having ideas of change and progress. The good Deacon Mamoon had made what was quite possibly a fatal mistake. He had underestimated the God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition, and now that it appeared as if the Cardinal was trying to put words into action, they decided it was about time to remind him of his place, in a most permanent fashion. Unfortunately, the Vindicari assassin they sent to take care of this particular problem was clearly not the top of his class, as he fluffed the assassination attempt and was subsequently killed by the Cardinal's bodyguards. This forced the Cardinal to move against the government on Vrax to ensure that no other organizations on the planet that might find uh, sympathy with the Inquisition's actions would be able to move against the Cardinal. And make no mistake, this was a life or death situation for the Cardinal. If he showed even the slightest hint of weakness now, after he had quite literally gotten shot at, that would essentially be the same as giving carte blanche to any other Imperial administration on the planet to have a go at him, since, after all, the Inquisition had tried. Thusly, anybody else who wanted to have a go would obviously be in the right. However, as unavoidable as this course of action undoubtedly was, it did result in a rather unfortunate incident. The faithful masses were clearly loyal and willing to rise up against Imperial authority in the Cardinal's name, but Zealots rarely make for the most disciplined of armies, and whilst storming the Imperial Adeptus Administratum headquarters on Vrax, they broke into the astropathic chambers and slaughtered all of the licensed psychers there within, the only means Vrax possessed of communicating with the wider Imperium. Throw in the fact that Vrax possessed no warp-capable starships, and the planet was, quite literally, 100% isolated from the rest of the Imperium, and whilst Vrax may have been the perfect position from which to launch a crusade of faith, that of course was dependent on the ability to actually leave Vrax at some point. And with no way of leaving the planet, and with no way of communicating from the planet, that meant that the Cardinal's enemies could say and do whatever they wanted, shape the narrative however it may please them. 
And this was of vital importance. If the Cardinal had been able to negotiate, he might leverage the fact that he sits upon huge quantities of weapons and supplies, necessary for the wider sector. He might argue the case that the Inquisition was incorrect in this, or that they had overstepped some boundary. At the very least, he might argue for leniency and avoid a direct military solution to this particular problem. He may even offer up some scapegoats, for example to avoid a particularly harsh judgement of his own actions. But with no way of communicating, that was not possible. And whilst, as I mentioned in the first video, a military resolution to this problem was far from guaranteed, when the Cardinal had absolutely no say in the matter and the Inquisition, the very people who had just so recently had a go at his life were the only ones allowed to interfere, well... It might seem like a foregone conclusion. And whilst of course the Cardinal was neck deep in shit, there was somebody even deeper in the poo poo. Namely, of course, his trusted advisor, Mamoon. The Cardinal might still be able to find some way out of this by leveraging his position, but a lowly deacon, well, somebody had to go under the wheels of the bus, and uh, there weren't really that many good options. It was therefore of paramount importance to Mamoon that whatever happened next, he was as indispensable to the Cardinal's well-being and continued success as possible. He needed to make himself very, very useful and very, very quickly. It might even be to his benefit if the Imperium decided on a more direct approach. But that also was far from ideal, as if the Inquisition knew of the Cardinal's actions, they also almost certainly knew who was pulling his strings. The moon's best chance was to return to his occult studies. Surely, there was something in the myriad of more or less forbidden tomes he had collected during his travels that would be of use in his current predicament. And when the Imperium's response manifested as a military one, and not just any military response, but one led by the Death Corps of Krieg, well, that was a pretty clear indication that any potential diplomatic solution was, well, and truly out the window. Meaning that Mamoon's particular brand of scholarly interest might just prove even more useful than he had thought. There was still one possible way out of this, and that was to make Vrax such an expensive project that the Imperium would decide that it would be better still to negotiate for the safe return of Vrax and therefore obviously certain promises of amnesty for the people on the planet in return for all of the weapons and supplies still stored beneath the Citadel. But of course there was one teensy weensy problem with this. Namely, that forcing the Imperium back to the negotiation table would naturally presuppose that it had become too expensive a venture, which meant that Vranx had to hold out against the full fury of the Death Corps of Krieg, probably for a decade at the very least, and possibly considerably more. It was fortunate, therefore, that the nature of Mamoon's literature was often of a somewhat combative nature. There were several passages promising all manners of martial power and prowess to those who could draw the attention of certain benevolent deities in the warp. If only Mamoon could harness this power, they might just stand a chance, and they were going to have to try. Because whilst once again Vrax was a fortress world, the defenders of said fortress left a lot to be desired. The PDF garrison were trained, relatively speaking, but they were few in numbers. The labor auxilia were considerably more numerous, but their training was much, much worse, even by the somewhat limited standards of the PDF, and the remaining portions of the population were well, often of dubious loyalty and entirely unskilled. If this ragtag horde of militia members and weekend warriors were to hold off the Death Corps of Krieg for possibly decades, they were going to need all the help they could possibly get. 
The problem was, however, that the galaxy is a very large place. There is always a fair bit of action going on, and so attracting the attention of these benevolent deities was a lot easier said than done. Even such a spectacle as a mass siege was far from guaranteed to draw their attention. However, there were ways to increase the odds. The inscribing of various runes and icons upon the equipment of or directly onto those doing the fighting could significantly increase the odds of catching the eye of one of these benevolent entities. And this would not necessarily provide all too much in the way of a challenge. The eight-pointed staff, for example, could easily be construed as a symbol of strength and unification. Hell, it could even, if you squinted at it a bit, look like some form of uh, fortress with spiked stars, perfect for the situation, seeing as they were about to be surrounded on all sides. A certain skull rune could be construed as the sign of a true warrior, and any who bore it would find himself overflowing with bravery and strength. This rune could mean life and growth. This could mean prosperity and enjoyment, a wish for happier times. And this, of course, this was change. A way out of their current predicament, perhaps. It was all a matter of perspective, because you see, any and all knowledge about chaos within the Imperium is extraordinarily strictly controlled for fear that it could grow out of hand, and considering the actions of the good Deacon, this was clearly not a unfounded fear. Because, of course, we know to some degree how chaos functions, and many of you should now as well. If you don't, I have made a video explaining it, and I suggest you go have a look at that, but I'll give you a brief explanation now. The founding principles of chaos are always the same, because they function of a set of rules. The warp exists because of our material universe, not the other way around. Therefore, we can to a certain degree predict what it is and how it may act, if you have the knowledge, of course, to make these predictions. Ironically, for all of the chaotic nature of chaos, it can in some ways be extraordinarily predictable, and one of the constants of chaos in whatever shape or form it may take is that it always seeks to grow, to feed, and to create more things to feed upon. This means that any and all actual knowledge about chaos will always seek to increase and grow, again, regardless of its nature. For example, merely knowing that the Skull Rune of Corn is the Skull Rune of Corn is enough to give it a certain amount of power. Now, not necessarily a lot, mind you, and a strong-willed person might be entirely able to ignore its influence upon him and therefore stunt its further growth, but there will always be something at the back of your mind, a nagging inclination, a suggestion that maybe you should spread the knowledge. You know, maybe there'll be some good reason. Perhaps spreading the knowledge might make it easier to fight against chaotic influence, for example. There will always be an attempt, no matter how weak or futile, on behalf of the thing you have now given power, to increase its power. Which, again, is why any and all knowledge is guarded so very, very tightly. And this level of control is undoubtedly necessary, but of course, there is a downside to it. Namely, that if a deacon, say, or even potentially a cardinal, starts walking amongst the defenders of a certain fortress world, drawing little eight-pointed stars on their chests, and telling them that it's a symbol of unity and strength, well, they're not going to know any better. Although, mind you, it is unclear whether or not Deacon Mamoon or the Cardinal really knew any better either. Mamoon had, at the very best, skimmed the surface of chaos, and the good Cardinal, well, he had been... not forced into this position, but, well... 
it's not entirely fair to say that he had arrived in his current predicament entirely out of his own choice. It is entirely possible that the Deacon thought that these icons were indeed the icons of, as I said, benevolent deities, and that using them was the will of the Emperor. He certainly would not be the first accidental heretic in the history of the modern Imperium, who did various horrible things in the belief that it was all necessary and for the good of all. Sadly, the uh, Deacon's kind and gentle gods were anything but, and now that they had started marking their men, their positions and their vehicles with symbols of strength and life and such on, chaos had already started taking root. And the moment it started, especially on such a virtually universal scale, it spread like wildfire. Pretty soon, Deacon Mamoon was utterly convinced that the only way they were ever going to get out of this was by pushing iconography and, in some cases, even outright worship of these icons across the entirety of Rax, all of its defenders and the civilian population. In part, this was the reason why he and the Cardinal created the Enforcers to ensure that their soldiers would remain loyal not only to the immediate military necessities of the war, but also to the Cardinal and the Good Deacon's vision of the future. In this regard, the eventual arrival of the Adeptus Astartes in the form of the Alpha Legion was an absolute godsend for the Deacon and the Cardinal. They now had the Emperor's avenging angels on their side, and this confirmed for anyone who still doubted that they were on the right side of history. The God Emperor himself had blessed their endeavour, and therefore anything and everything the Cardinal and the Deacon had said and done were obviously blessed and above any form of criticism. Unfortunately, the Astartes came with an agenda all of their very own, and they were not entirely happy with how the good Deacon was running things. They wanted to expand the war, and it appears as if the Deacon and the Alpha Legion had very different ideas on how to do this, as Lord Arcos of the Alpha Legion would eventually freeze the Deacon entirely out of the Cardinal's inner circle. In fact, he would eventually come to entirely monopolise the Cardinal's time and play him like a happy little fiddle. And the tune that was playing was the great ritual that you saw just a hint of in the last episode. It was about to bring forth some rather more obvious representatives of the various deities the population of Rax had been worshipping unknowingly for quite some time already. And when the manifestations of their new gods arrived, the population did not recoil in fear, rather they embraced them as the angels of their gods. And that shows you just how thoroughly the defenders and the population in general had been corrupted over the previous decade or so of warfare. They may only have been exposed to the merest hints of the true power of chaos via iconography and half-assed prayers, but it was more than enough. The moment chaos begins to grow in any area, it spreads rapidly, and the moment it begins, it is virtually unstoppable, as Vrax so tragically demonstrated. So now you know how chaos came to Vrax. It was the good Cardinal and his friends, and their effect upon the Cardinal. The poor population of Vrax were, by and large, innocent, but unfortunately, ignorance and innocence is no defence against the warping taint of chaos. In the words of Colonel Commissar Ibrahim Gaunt of the Tarnith First, the only true defence against chaos is an armour of contempt. And with that, I'll be wrapping up this video. As usual, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for watching. If you like this video and the Siege of Rax in general, please do consider sharing it around to friends and other interested parties. 
Until next time, have a good day.